Atheists have a burden of proof. It's as simple as that. Liar. When talking about the existence of a God, a common misconception is that the only the theist holds the burden of proof. Oh, no, 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 nobody. However, atheists may also bear this responsibility. This idea might surprise some, but it's essential to understand that in any rational discourse, anyone making a claim may need to back it up. The purpose of the series is simple, to explain what burden of proof is and to demonstrate that atheists may have to provide a burden of proof if they want to hold their position irrational by others or at least themselves. By understanding this concept, we can ensure that discussions about the belief and disbelief of the non-existence or existence of a God remains fair and intellectually honest. Understanding the burden of proof is crucial for maintaining rational and productive conversations. Without it, discussions can become one-sided and unbalanced. By acknowledging that both theists and atheists have responsibilities in these discussions, if they choose to have these discussions, we can create a more respectful and intellectually honest dialogue. In this series, I'll try to delve deeper into what burden of proof entails, how it applies to both theists and atheists, why it's a fundamental aspect of rational discourse, and among other things. And I ask you to stay tuned as I explain my reasoning on these concepts, and I try to bring more clarity on this often misunderstood topic. I mean, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next video. Like or dislike, and comment how you feel. A phrase I often hear is that the theist has to provide the burden of proof. Let's be clear. Both atheists and theists bear the burden of proof for their claims. Are you serious? Well, duh. This principle is rooted in philosophical definitions of these terms, and even the lack theist terms which we'll explore later. Throughout history, both theists and atheist philosophers have presented arguments to support their respective positions. Theist philosophers like Thomas Aquinas and William Craig have provided robust arguments for the existence of a god. On the other hand, atheist philosophers like Richard Dawkins and Graham Opie have offered compelling arguments against the non-existence of a god or the existence of no god, or something like that. Both sides have engaged deeply with the burden of proof. It's important to understand that the statement, the theist has to provide the burden of proof is misleading. Theists, in general, have already provided the burden of proof through various arguments and evidence. However, whether an individual accepts this as proof that God exists is a different matter altogether. This distinction is crucial. Providing the burden of proof and accepting it are two separate issues. Both can be true simultaneously, especially in the case of philosophical discussions. Recognizing that both theists and atheists bear the burden of proof for their claims is essential for a fair and balanced discourse. Without this mutual understanding, discussions can become lopsided, with one side unfairly expected to justify their position while the other side remains unchallenged. By acknowledging the shared responsibility, we can foster more meaningful and productive conversations about the existence of a God. In future videos, I'll try to discuss what the burden proof is a little more in depth, but understanding these principles is a key to engaging in rational and respectful debates and discussions. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next installment of the series. Now, let me be clear. In the past, I created videos detailing that atheism is best described as the belief that there is no God, following the philosophical definition used in academia. While I still believe this is the most precise way to define atheism, for this discussion, I will include the popular definition among certain self-proclaimed atheists the lack of belief that there is a God. I mean, it still wouldn't matter which definition you choose, because despite the different definitions, both positions still carry a burden of proof. Previously in my videos, which argued that atheism is best understood as the belief that there is no God, were not well received by some viewers, who admits not watching them while strawmaning my position, I stand by this definition because it aligns with the philosophical and academic understanding of the word atheism. However, I do recognize that many people identify as atheists by stating they just lack the belief in a God rather than actively believing there is no God. It's crucial to understand that whether one defines atheism as the belief that there is no God or as a lack of belief in a God, both positions carry a burden of proof. This reason is simple. Both stances make a claim. The belief that there is no God is a direct claim, a claim that one believes there is no God, while the lack of belief in a God is also a claim, a claim that one lacks to believe there is a God. To differentiate between these definitions in these videos I've created, I might use the terms lack theist or non-theist. These terms more accurately capture the position of those who define their atheism as merely just lacking the belief in a God, distinguishing it from the philosophical definition. Making this distinction is important because it helps clarify the different types of claims being made and the corresponding responsibilities for providing justification. 
Whether you are atheist, atheist, lactheist, non-theist, whoever, engaging in rational discourse requires recognizing and fulfilling your burden of proof. By understanding and acknowledging the nuances of how both definitions evolve a burden of proof, we can ensure more respectful and productive conversations about the belief and disbelief in the existence of a God. Again, thank you for watching and stay tuned next video where I try to delve in deeper into these concepts. To understand the burden of proof, it's essential to first define what a claim is. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a claim can be defined as to assert and demand recognition of an alleged right, title, possession, attribute, acquirement, or the like. To assert as one's own, to affirm one's possession. Simply put, a claim is any statement that asserts something to be true. For example, there is X, I believe there is X, and I lack the belief in X are all claims. All are assertions. One is a claim about the nature of reality, another is a claim on the belief states, while the other is still a claim on the belief state, but more specifically the lack of belief. They all stay in position regarding a particular subject. In the base about the existence of a God, the statement, God is this, is a direct claim. More specifically, individuals may assert it is true that God is this, or it is false that God is this. Both of these are direct claims about the nature of reality. On the other hand, if someone states, I lack the belief that God is this, or I'm unconvinced that God is this, this is not a negation of the original claim, but rather a rejection. It's crucial to understand that the rejection of the claim God is this, or it is true that God is this, is a claim itself. Huh? Huh? It implies the absence of belief in the existence of a God, which requires justification to hold that position rationally. It's even in the words. If you state something, you have effectively made a claim. The importance of defining claims lies in understanding that even stating the absence of belief can be seen as a claim. For instance, an atheist statement of lacking the belief in God is not a neutral position. It implies a stance that also demands justification. By recognizing that both direct assertions and rejections are claims, we can better understand the burden of proof that both parties have in these discussions. This understanding is crucial for maintaining fair and rational discourse. Whether you are affirming a belief or rejecting it, you are making a statement about reality, or at the very least, your reality, that requires evidence or reasoning. This understanding of defining a claim and how both direct and indirect assertions require justifications are foundational for any rational discourse, especially those about the existence of a God. Stay tuned as I try to go deeper into the burden of proof and how it applies to both theists and atheists. But again, thanks for watching a lot. So in discussions about the belief in a God, a critical concept often overlooked is epistemic justification. Bro, what are you talking about, man? Now this refers to the reasoning or evidence that makes a belief not just rational, but also justifiable within a framework of knowledge. For those who claim to lack the belief that there is a God, Understanding epistemic justification is crucial because it underscores the burden of proof that still applies, even when one doesn't assert the non-existence of a God. Epistemic justification is the reasoning or evidence that makes a belief rationally acceptable and knowledge conductive. It's not just about holding a belief, or lack thereof, but about having sound reasons that justify that position in a way that contributes to the pursuit of truth. In other words, epistemic justification ensures that a belief, or the lack of one, is not arbitrary but grounded in rational consideration and is aligned with what is known and can be known. When someone says they lack the belief that there is a God, they are not necessarily making a direct claim about the non-existence of a God, but are instead rejecting theistic claims. However, this position still requires epistemic justification. To hold this lack of belief rationally, one would be able to justify why they find theistic claims unconvincing or why the evidence presented by theists does not meet their standards for belief. Let's try this example. Person A may state, I lack the belief that there is a God. Person B may ask, why do you lack that belief? Person A's response could be, because I haven't seen evidence for a God. Now in this exchange, person A not only states their lack of belief, but also provides a reason for it. This reason, stating that they haven't seen evidence, serves as person A's epistemic justification. It's this justification that satisfies the burden of proof for their stance. Without offering this reasoning, person A's position might be seen as arbitrary or unjust. Now, one could argue that the reason they gave was weak or just a given. It would be like someone stating I've seen evidence for a God as reasoning for why they claim God is this. But in simplest terms, we can keep it for now. However, it's important to realize that person A has introduced a new claim. I haven't seen evidence for a God. Now this claim itself carries a burden of proof. Person A now bears responsibility to what they consider to be adequate evidence and why there is no evidence they encounter for a God. If they don't provide further reasoning, their position might still be questioned for a lack of justification. One must understand burden of proof bounces back and forth often in discussion. 
Now, understanding epistemic justification is crucial for maintaining intellectually honest and rigor in discussions about the belief and disbelief in the existence of a God. It's the why behind the belief or lack thereof. Now, without this justification, the stance lacking belief could be seen as arbitrary. Providing epistemic reasons, individuals can demonstrate that their position is rational and grounded in evidence or reasoning of some sort. In summary, when someone states they lack the belief that there is a God, they still carry a burden of proof in the form of epistemic justification to explain why they do not accept theistic claims. This ensures that their position is rational and contributes to fair and meaningful discussions about the existence of a God. What is the burden of proof? What? Understanding this principle is essential for anyone trying to engage in rational discourse, especially when debating about the existence of a God. In philosophy, the burden of proof, or the Latin phrase, one is probating, which I probably got this wrong, horribly, refers to the duty of a person making a claim to provide evidence or reasoning supporting their assertion. Simply put, the burden of proof is the responsibility to prove one's claim. This is crucial for maintaining rational discourse and preventing the acceptance of unfounded beliefs. Everybody knows the moon's made of cheese. Without this requirement, discussions could easily devolve into basis assertions and unsubstantiated claims. But it's important to note that while the concept of burden of proof is also foundational in law, there are also significant differences between its application in legal context and in philosophy. I mean, in law, the burden of proof is a formal obligation with standards such as beyond a reasonable doubt in criminal cases and the preponderance of the evidence in civil cases. These standards ensure that claims are substantiated before being accepted as true, protecting individuals from wrongful convictions and unfair judgments. However, while in philosophical discussions, there usually isn't a third party like a judge or jury to determine if the burden of proof has been met. It is subjective and based on the perspective of the parties involved to adequately determine if the burden of proof is met. For example, a person may state God is real because the Bible says so. One individual might accept this conclusion, believing that the burden of proof has been met due to their trust in the historical and spiritual authority of the Bible. However, another individual might reject this conclusion, arguing that the Bible is not a historically accurate or empirically verifiable source. This example illustrates a simple scenario, but the principle aligns to more complex debates and discussions as well. It shows that two individuals can have different viewpoints on whether the burden of proof has been met. Now this difference does not necessarily mean that one party can provide an irrational stance and meet the burden of proof. Rather, it shows the subjective nature of assessing what burden proof is in philosophical discussions. Both parties are making claims and must provide supporting evidence for their positions. But there is no universal standard to determine conclusively whether the burden has been met. The burden proof serves as a crucial safeguard against accepting propositions without sufficient justification. In philosophical debates, especially those concerning the existence of a god or gods, this concept is vital and ensures that arguments are critically examined and supported by evidence, fostering rational discourse rather than ones based on Examine the beliefs. Both parties must demonstrate integrity and understanding to evaluate if the burden of proof has been met. <laughs> now, understanding the burden of proof is foundational for engaging in meaningful and rational discussions. In philosophy, this principle helps ensure that the claims are substantiated and critically examined. By recognizing the importance of the burden of proof, we can contribute to more thoughtful and reasonable discussions about the belief and disbelief in the existence of a God. There is an important distinction between negation and rejection of claims. The difference is critical for understanding the dynamics of the burden of proof, especially in discussions about the existence of a God. Some people believe that merely rejecting a claim or the lack of belief does not require the burden of proof, unlike the outright negation. Now let's examine this further. Negation involves directly contradicting a claim. For example, if someone states God exists and you respond with God does not exist, you are negating the original claim. This is a clear counter claim that requires its own set of proofs and arguments. Whether you negate a claim, you are making a positive assertion about the non-existence of something, and thus you bear the burden of proof to support this assertion. Granted, both parties do. Now, rejection on the other hand, involves dismissing a claim without necessarily providing a counter claim. For instance, a non-theist might say, I do not accept the claim that God exists without asserting that God does not exist. While this might seem like a non-claim, it is still a claim. It still necessitates reasoning for why the original claim was not accepted. Simply rejecting a claim does not absolve one from the burden of proof because it still implies a position that requires justification. Both are claims. It's important to understand that both negation and rejection are positions that engage with the original claim and therefore involves a burden of proof. By stating, I do not accept the claim that God exists, an individual is still making an assertion about their stance on the claim, which requires justification. Just as with the negation, this rejection needs to be supported by reasoning or evidence. Understanding the difference between negation and rejection helps clarify why atheists, even those who merely reject theistic claims without making direct counterclaims, such as a non-theist, still holds a burden of proof. What? This position implies a need to justify why they do not accept the theistic claim, as this is crucial for maintaining rational discourse 
and ensuring that all positions are critically examined and supported by evidence. I mean, in summary, both negation and rejection of claims involve a burden of proof. Whether you are directly contradicting a claim or simply rejecting it, you are making a statement that requires justification. Recognizing this distinction helps foster more thoughtful and reasoned conversations about the belief and disbelief in the existence of a God. In any discussion, especially those about the existence of a God, the burden of proof isn't a static responsibility. Instead, it often shifts back and forth between the participants as each side presents new claims, counters, or challenges. Understanding this dynamic is crucial for engaging in fair and balanced conversations. The burden of proof initially rests with the person making a claim. However, as conversation progresses, the other party may introduce counterclaims or challenges, effectively taking on a new burden of proof themselves. This shift in dynamic is what keeps the conversation rational and ensures that all positions are adequately justified. Let's consider this example. Person A may state, I lack the belief that there is a God. Person B may respond with, why do you lack that belief? Person A's response could be, because I haven't seen evidence for a God. Person B can then state, what about the fine tuning of the universe? Doesn't that suggest the existence of a designer? Person A's final response could be, I find natural explanations like the multiverse theory more compelling than the idea of a divine designer. In this conversation, the burden of proof shifts multiple times. Firstly, person A starts by making a claim about their lack of belief and they provide epistemic justification by stating they haven't seen evidence. Then, person B challenges this by introducing a counterclaim about the fine tuning of the universe, which shifts the burden of proof to them. Person A then counters with an alternative explanation, the multiverse theory, shifting the burden of proof back to them to justify why this explanation is more compelling. Understanding when and how the burden of proof shifts is key to maintaining a productive conversation. Participants should be aware that introducing new claims or counterclaims mean they take on the responsibility to justify those positions. Failing to do so can lead to an unbalanced discussion, where one side unfairly shoulders the burden while the other side avoids scrutiny. Now sometimes, in an attempt to win an argument, one party might keep raising the standards for evidence or changing the criteria for what counts as acceptable proof. Now this is known as shifting the goalposts. It's important to recognize that this tactic and ensure that the conversation remains fair by holding each side accountable to the same standards of proof throughout the discussion. Overall, the burden of proof in a conversation is dynamic, often bouncing back and forth as claims and counterclaims are made. By understanding this process, participants can engage in more balanced and fair discussions, ensuring that all positions are properly justified and that the conversation remains focused on rational discourse. Shifting the burden of proof is a common logical fallacy in debates about the existence of a God. I insist. Or even in debates in general. Understanding this fallacy is crucial for maintaining fair and rational discussions. As I try to clarify why asking someone to substantiate their claims is not necessarily shifting the burden of proof. Shifting the burden of proof is a logical fallacy when one party attempts to make the other party prove their claim without first substantiating their own. For example, if a theist says God exists with an atheist responding with, how or can you prove it? Followed by the theist stating, prove that God does not exist. If you can't, then God exists. They are shifting the burden of proof onto the atheist without first providing evidence for God's existence. This tactic evades the responsibility of providing evidence for one's own claim and it seems a form of intellectually dishonesty. In productive debates, both parties should be willing to present and defend their claims. Shifting the burden of proof disrupts the balance and places an unfair expectation on the opposing party. Recognizing this fallacy is essential for maintaining fair and rational discourse and ensures that each each party takes responsibility for substantiating their own claims rather than unfairly demanding that the other side disprove them. It's important to note that asking an atheist to provide the burden of proof for their claim is not shifting the burden of proof. When an atheist asserts that there is no God or just lacks the belief in a God, they are making a claim that also requires substantiation. This expectation of providing evidence or reason is part of engaging in a fair and balanced discourse. Now to avoid shifting the burden of proof, ensure that you provide evidence or reasoning for your own claim before asking the other party to do the same. For instance, atheists should present their arguments and evidence for the existence of a God before challenging an atheist to disprove it. Now similarly, an atheist should substantiate their lack of belief or belief in the nonsense of a god before demanding proof from the theist. In summary, shifting the burden of proof is a fallacy that undermines the productive and fair debates. Both parties must take responsibility for substantiating their own claims to maintain intellectually honesty and rational discourse. By understanding and avoiding this fallacy, we can foster more respectful and meaningful discussions about the belief and disbelief in the existence of a god. There is an importance on having an honest conversations when talking about the existence of a god. Merely rejecting claims without providing counter arguments or justifications is unproductive. For a dialogue to be fruitful, both parties must engage with the other's claims and provide reasons for their own acceptance or rejection. 
simply stating, I reject your claim. Without giving any justification, does not advance the conversation or contribute to mutual understanding. Atheists, like theists, or even non-theists or lack theists, should be prepared to explain why they reject theistic claims and what evidence or reasoning supports their position. This approach fosters a more respectful and constructive dialogue, allowing for both sides to better understand each other perspective. Now, when both parties engage with the arguments presented and provide well-reasoned responses, the conversation becomes much more meaningful and productive. Honest conversations require several key principles. Firstly, be willing to consider and evaluate the evidence presented by the other party. This missing evidence without consideration is not conducted to a productive dialogue. Secondly, apply critical thinking to assess the validity and the strength of the arguments, as this involves analyzing the logic, the evidence, and the assumptions underlying the claims. Thirdly, make a sincere effort to understand the opposing viewpoint. This means listening actively and trying to comprehend the rationale behind the other stance. Now, by her to these few principles, parties can move beyond mere assertion and engage in meaningful and productive discourse. Now, in summary, honest conversations are essential for productive debates about the existence of a God. Merely rejecting claims about the justification is unproductive and does not contribute to mutual understanding. Both atheists and theists should be prepared to explain their positions and engage with the evidence and the arguments presented. By fostering openness to evidence, critical thinking, and a genuine effort to understand, we can create a more respectful and constructive dialogue. Talking about how atheists have a burner proof, there seems to be a lot of critics based on my explanation. Whether you take the philosophical standard or your colloquial meaning of the word atheism. But the funny thing is, I'm willing to bet that the critics agree with me. They just don't like the words I'm using to explain my reasoning. Try to answer these four questions. If I state that God exists, and someone asks for why or for my reasons, am I expected to respond if I want to have an honest conversation about it? If I state that God exists, and someone asks for why or for my reasons, but I don't want to discuss it any further, am I still expected to answer? If I state that you lack the belief in a God, and I ask why or for your reasons, are you expected to respond if you want to have an honest conversation about it? If you state that you lack the belief in a God, and I ask why or for your reasons, but you don't want to discuss it any further, are you still expected to answer? I'm pretty sure your responses will be yes, no, yes, no. I've been saying this the whole time. If I claim that God exists, and someone asks why or requests my epistemic justification, Am I expected to respond to fulfill my burden of proof if I want to have an honest conversation about it? If I state that God exists, and someone asks why or requests my epistemic justification, but I don't want to discuss it any further, am I still expected to fulfill my burden of proof? If you claim that you lack the belief in a God, and I ask why or request your epistemic justification, are you expected to respond to fulfill your burden of proof if you want to have an honest conversation about it? If you claim that you lack the belief in a God, and I ask why or request your epistemic justification, but you don't want to discuss it any further, are you still expected to fulfill your burden of proof? Now replace state with claim, epistemic justification with your reasons for it, and add fulfill the burden of proof to emphasize the point. It's like saying I provide evidence and I provide evidence for my claim means the same. But apparently I'm wrong for not using your definitions. Now, in the end, our disagreements often stem from differences in terminology rather than the underlying principles we both value, like importance of providing reasons and engaging in honest discourse. By focusing on these shared values, we can foster more productive and meaningful conversations, even if we don't agree on the exact definitions. Welcome to the final video in the series on the burden of proof. Throughout this expanded series, we explore several crucial concepts. We began by defining the burden of proof and its significance in both law and philosophy, the principle that ensures that claims are substantiated before being accepted as true, fostering rational discourse. We clarified that both theists and atheists, lack theists or non-theists, bear the burden of proof for their respective claims. Whether one asserts that a God exists, or a God does not exist, or they lack the belief in a God, all positions require some type of evidence or reasoning to support them. We looked at understanding what constitutes a claim is crucial. Both direct assertions and rejections involve making claims that necessitate justification. We differentiate between negation, directly contradicting a claim, and rejection, dismissing a claim without necessarily providing a counterclaim. Both requires a burden of proof to justify the position taken. We discuss the fallacy of shifting the burden of proof and emphasize the importance of each party substantiating their own claims rather than unfairly demanding the other side disprove them. We explore how epistemic justification underpins rational belief or disbelief, ensuring that one position is not arbitrary but grounded in reason. We examine how burden of proof can shift throughout a conversation, depending on who makes the next claim or counterclaim and how this dynamic is vital for a balanced discourse. We highlight the importance of engaging in honest conversations by providing counterarguments and justifications for one stance, as this fosters a more respectful and constructive dialogue. Finally, we address how differences in definitions can lead to apparent disagreements, emphasizing the importance of focusing on the underlying principles rather than just terminology. In conclusion, atheists, non-theists, lactheists, theists, whoever, have a burner proof. 
Both positions involve making claims and must be substantiated with evidence or reasoning. By recognizing and fulfilling your perspective burdens of proof, atheists, theists, lack theists, non-theists can contribute to a more rational and respectful discourse. 